So if you have your Bibles or your cell phone, I, I prefer the good uh, analog Bible, <laughs> the old school Bible, turn with me to Colossians. We're going to start in the New Testament, but then we're going to find our home in the Old Testament. So Colossians chapter 3, I'm just going to read the first four verses, and that's, and this will be from my version, I happen to have the NIV. Since then, that you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So that when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I kind of want to focus on those first two lines. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. What I love most about the Bible is I feel like every word is on purpose. You see, when Paul wrote this, he could have just as easily switched those two around. He could have just as easily said, oh, set your mind on Christ, as in think about Jesus, and set your heart, what you want, not on things of the world. But that's not the order that he chose here. Set your heart, that means your longing, your desires, your goal on Christ, what he's done, where he sits now, but also to me, that means to model your desires after those that Christ himself has. And then your mind, shift your mind, your attentions away from worldly things. Because did you know, did you know that you could desire God have your heart set on God, but your attention is elsewhere? In fact, even right now, you, you could be listening, but your attentions are elsewhere. You all came to church, or if you're listening to it online, you all switched on a sermon, so your heart is on God. Your intentions might be the right place, but your attentions, your mind could be drifting from the conflict you might have had this morning on the things that you know might be waiting for you as soon as you come home, it's very easy to have one foot in the right place but the other one drifting. So if you're like me and you like those funny little yoga classes or those little exercise classes where they make you twist and turn and make all these silly, ridiculous poses, anytime you have to balance, what is it you hear them say or you've seen them say? Focus on one spot in the room. And that's to help you catch your balance. So even the world knows that a singular focus naturally cultivates stability. Think about the people in our lives that maybe they're very ambitious or they say, oh, she has a one-track mind. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, if that is your focus, that's where you're heading, you're probably eventually gonna get it. So the singularity of your focus is important but also now the accuracy of that focus, where you are directing, that'll be determining whether you continue in the right direction. Because of that, the title of my message today is Healing the Vision. Healing the Vision, as in healing the vision we have, whether it's God's plan or destiny for our own lives, whether it's healing the vision as in God's overall design of what his intention is for mankind, or it might even be in an individual situation. How do you align yourself to God's values, how he wants you to resolve that particular situation so that you can make the mark, so that you can hit the mark? When you know God's values and you know his intention in a particular situation, it keeps you on target, regardless of the distractions or circumstances or opposition might be in your way. Brother Jerry, you mentioned briefly how sometimes you listen to Z88, and 
I, I will say there are some great songs of like faith and victory and power, but sometimes we have to acknowledge there are ones coming from this sort of destitute, broken spiritual place. And I'm not mad at the radio station for that, just like I'm not mad when I woke up this morning and the temperature said it was The thermometer is telling me, but the thermometer is merely a reflection of what's going on around me. There was an artist, and he was giving his personal testimony, and it gave me a little insight what might be going on in those situations. This was a particular man whose son had diabetes, diagnosed ever since he was but a toddler at two years old. And as he's sort of heartbroken and talking about what happens, he was saying, and you know, diabetes doesn't just go away. And he continues to go on and give a testimony. Now, the testimony was powerful in that even if you haven't seen the healing or even if you haven't seen God act a certain way in your life, you still have to hold on to his character as being good, as being a healer, as being a foundation nonetheless. So I'm not bashing him at all, but I felt something in the way that he said it. It wasn't a diabetes doesn't, doesn't just go away from a place of maturity. He said it from a place of pain. You could kind of hear in his voice, yep, when he was two or three, we prayed. We prayed for three, four, five years. And now somewhere inside of him, he no longer thinks it is God's will to heal his child. You see, that's a little bit of a different situation. Now, it's not an evil thing. It's, it's a human thing. It's a coping strategy. When something you know to be true doesn't manifest in your own life, you, you disengage from it in a certain way. So in this case, because the healer, the great God he sings about, he feels maybe wasn't present in that way, he lowered his expectation of God so that he wouldn't be disappointed. I want to give you a, an opposite situation. I was watching a man, his name is uh, Daniel Kalinda. He, his mentor was some great African preacher, some, some white guy who spent his whole life in Africa, healing and preaching, I don't remember his name, uh, doing revivals. And this man had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documented miracles all throughout the continent of Africa. Daniel Kalinda was in an interview and he was, explain, he was retelling a conversation he had with his mentor. Let's call the mentor Rob. Rob, how are you able to have these miracles? How can you pray and keep up your confidence when for just as many people you see healed, you see hundreds walking away not healed? And this is what the mentor told him. He said, if you pray for 10 men and not one of them was healed, when you pray for that 11th man, you pray with the same vigor and intensity as if all 10 other men walked up and received their healing. And it is that mentality that allowed him to press in and obtain that healing that he was seeking. When you don't lose that momentum. So although my title today is Healing the Vision, my theme is sensing and obtaining our destinies. Now we're going to go ahead and get parked over in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6 is where the bulk of uh, my story is going to come from. We're going to use a biblical example and pull out some maybe relevant illustrations here for our own lives. This is Elisha and his servant. This is a time when, uh, I'll even start, so 2 Kings chapter 6, I'm going to start from verse 8. And if we can even just have, yeah, just and keep that one there uh, as I continue. Now, the king of Aram was at war with, the, with Israel. And much like any war, he's a strategist. He'd gather his various officials. They'll make plans saying, okay, on such and such a day, we will move our camp to such and such a place. Normal war-like strategies, right? But 
as the king would make this move, the Holy Spirit or the Lord would be revealing to Elisha his positioning, his movements. And he would then alert the king of Israel, oh, be on guard when you go down this crevasse or when you go into this valley because the king of Aram is there, so be prepared. This happened once. This happened twice. This happened three times. The Bible isn't specific for the number of instances this little intervention occurred, but it happened so many times that the king of Aram, in his rage, got frustrated and said to his officials, so which one of you is working for the king of Israel? It was so bad, and Elisha's information was so accurate and so spot on that the king himself thought there was a mole in his organization. Verse 12, none of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. (laughs) I don't know if that was an exaggeration, but you know what that jokingly kind of reminds me? Well, then one of those officials must be talking to Israelites because otherwise, how does he know the gossip? (laughs) So at the very least, the word of what Elisha was doing was so astounding that the gossip was getting around how the secret movements of the Arameans was getting out. So now verse 13, go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men, men and capture him. Quick pause. This isn't, isn't, isn't even a part of my message, but isn't it funny how the devil just changed his strategy right there? First, he wants to impoverish the Israelites, so they're trying to ambush and send raids against Israel. And soon as they discover where the source of information is coming from, they shift strategies to capture the watchmen. So as a little bonus track, there are many times that we are the watchmen over the lives and situations. Uh, in in our lives and in our loved ones. Do not be discouraged if it seems like the enemy shifts his focus towards you. And there's a lot of ways the enemy can capture the watchman that doesn't involve surrounding your town with an army. If you're someone and you are waiting for your own personal healing or you're waiting on your own breakthrough, he can capture the watchman simply by planting the doubt, oh, God can do it. But obviously he isn't. Obviously he's not willing. And then it neutralizes that influence in the moment. That's a bonus note. That's not even what we're going on. So, but just tuck that in, tuck that into your back pocket. Go and find out where he is, the king ordered, verse 13, so I can send men to capture him. In short, when they discovered the city where the prophet was living, they ditched They dispatch soldiers and army and a portion of their army. And in the night, they surrounded the entire city. You see, they weren't going to, they weren't going to, they're playing it safe. They weren't going to try to find just the one place or investigate. They're surrounding the whole city. (laughs) They're going to take everything that's involved and make trouble and try to, to extinguish the mouth, the word of God coming forth from this place. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. He said, oh, my Lord, what shall we do? Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And verse 17, and Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. I mentioned that we're going to be talking about healing the vision, why we need God to restore our sense, our bird's eye perspective of what's going on. And the first reason is we need God to heal our vision because that extinguishes fear. Now think about it. When Elisha prayed to open the servant's eyes, and now the servant saw these chariots of fire, did that activate these angelic forces that were there? It didn't bring the angelic forces there. They were already there. The only thing Elisha's prayer to open his eyes did was increase his awareness of the resources that were already present. 
So much like our own lives, whether or not we see God's upper hand in the situation, he still has sovereignty and he still has support in that situation so that there can be victory, right? But oftentimes we don't see it. So what does that fear do to us? And we've all been afraid. We've all dealt with something that we felt was just a little bit bigger than we could chew. How do we respond? Maybe the fear causes us to be inactive. I, maybe I would have said something to defend myself or defend my faith, but I don't really know if people are going to like it. I don't really know if there's going to be repercussions, so I stay silent. I'm inactive. Or if you're not inactive, maybe you might be underactive you don't quite say what you would have said under a different circumstance. And if you're not underactive, maybe you might be overactive. So you see how fear distorts your direction? The fear doesn't change your circumstance. The fear doesn't change God's intention or his provision. It, in, it just influences our response to it. With inaction, he causes you to take no, and you to take no move and you see no results. In under action, you see less results or less blessing than you originally thought was what God really intended for that situation. And in an overreaction, he's, the enemy just got a way to divert your energy in a whole different direction. Gehazi is a great example. Gehazi is what, from previous chapters, the name of that servant is. A great example of someone whose heart might have been set on God but whose mind was on the circumstances. Priscilla Shear has many uh, sermons about dealing with fear and interacting with, uh, interacting with the enemy from a place of victory, from a place of knowing that your God is already there and that being your stability. Now, we all know uh, in 2 Timothy 1.17, we know that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And I'll, I'll describe another day, maybe on one of the, the deeper life inspirational moments, what I think that power, love, and a sound mind really is. But she says something very clever. She said, if you enter a situation and you sense some sort of fear welling up in you, and you know that the word of God says that the Lord does not give us a spirit of fear, then who is giving that spirit of fear, right? So if God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but you are feeling fear entering a situation, you know by process of deduction that it's not from God. And if it's not from God, it's the enemy. Whether it's the enemy or your own mind. Now, if it's not from God and it's the enemy, then he's obviously doing it because he's trying to stop you from doing or saying something. So if the enemy is trying to stop you from doing or saying something in that situation, that means there must be something in that situation that is good for you. Something that God wants you to do and accomplish. You see, if you pull, up out, pull apart the layers, if you can discern the true source of fear, you could also discern the true purpose of that fear. So much like uh, Elisha, we pray, oh, Lord, open our eyes so that this emotional reaction that is not from you doesn't change the course of my direction. Verse 17, when Elisha prayed this, the Lord opened the servant's eyes. He looked, saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. 18, as the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness, so that he struck them with blindness, just as Elisha had asked. Isn't that kind of ironic? Isn't that kind of ironic that in verse 17, uh, one of the strategies was to open the eyes, and then the next verse later, a strategy was to close someone's eyes. I think that's a great comparison to see exactly what a loss of vision can do. So we know when you have opened your vision and you see God's provision, it extinguishes fear. But in a situation where the vision is lacking or, or where the vision has been closed, 
look at what Elisha does with this little strategy. So after the Lord struck them, the army with blindness, Elisha came and told them, this is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I'll lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them right into Samaria, into the presence of their enemy, the king of Israel. Now, in this case, this is blindness being used constructively. But what does that tell us? When you do not have vision in your circumstance, you can be easily influenced. You see, what he did, because they could no longer see, Elisha is telling them, oh, the man you're looking for isn't here. He was the man they were looking for. He said, oh, you're not in the right city. You're not in the right place. They were exactly in the right place. <laughs> and I'm going to take you to the man that you're looking for. They took them to the last human on earth that they wanted to see. You see, when your eyes are closed, you can be led anywhere because you're not seeing what's going on and you're not able to discern the validity of the statements that you might be hearing. Here's an application in, in our common lives. So when I was in college, there was always like young lady groups or young men's groups. This particular young lady group, I didn't join because they were reading some chick book, right? And at that age in my life, I was not interested in that sort of thing. However, I did learn from the other girls who did read this book, I believe it was called Captivating, and there's a, a version for guys called Wild at Heart. But in the Captivating book, it's giving women strategies how to sort of fortify themselves and achieve their godly purpose on earth without being pulled aside by, by temptation. So they have one particular situation about, you know, resisting sexual sin and sexual immorality. And this might seem really practical, but one of the advice that they gave in that book, it gives the girls, is that you need to have a vision for your future, for your future spouse, for your future marriage and have a good understanding of what a godly relationship is supposed to look like. So that when there are other counterfeits or almost as goods pulling and vying for your time and attention, you don't get caught into it. You see, no one wakes up one morning and decides, I'm going to grow up and be a homeless man. You know, these things that end up hurting us in our life happens one little decision at a time. Because in the moment, it was better than the alternative. So, oh, I'm going to date person A because at least he bathes more than person B. Doesn't really mean person A is going to be a godly husband. Or I'm going to choose job A over job B. Yes, it's not a really great environment, but the tips are good. Yes, I have to wear kind of a scantily clad outfit, but I can save money for college. A lot of times when you make a decision for a, a second best, it's not because you were aiming for second best. It's because at that moment, it was the best thing. It was the lesser of two evils. So what her advice is in all the different areas of your life, set an objective standard. So when anything else comes by that doesn't look like that, you have a frame of reference to decide, no, I'm going to pass. Because you know, every time you say yes to a certain decision, you are simultaneously saying no to every other decision like it. Every time you say yes to a particular job at this stage in my life, I'm saying no to anything else God possibly could have had me, had for me. When I say yes to a certain friend who may not be the best influence, I'm saying no to the other person that God has at the office that might be a, a better partnership at this stage in my life. So really, it's all comparison anyway. So you can only withstand some of these alternatives if you have a goal, a vision set in mind. So the reason God heals our vision or the reason we need a vision is because it extinguishes fear, prevents us from being easily influenced. And the next one, give me a minute to, to kind of uh, explain this one to you. So, back at the army, blinded, being led now into the presence of the king of Israel. And when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them? 
shall I kill them, my father? You can just hear the eagerness in his voice. Elisha, want me to, you want me to use the sword or you want me to use the bow and arrow? Should I, should I kill them? All right, so how did our story start here today? We're going to look. It started, verse 8, now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. Not to, not to spoil the end of the story, but if you fast forward to the very last line of verse 23, it says, so the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Here's what I'm getting at here. Remember how I said the end results in our lives are all a culmination of small individual choices that build up over time? So in this scenario, they went from war with this country. And by the end of this paragraph, they're going to have a ceasefire or peace with this country. That didn't happen by a series of random occurrences. Not and anything could have gotten gone wrong at this point. So what I'm trying to say that there's many alternate endings when you live in the world that we do where you have a lifetime of choices to make. And there's many ways that this story could have gone wrong. I'll give you a real quick example. In the same book, 2 Kings chapter 1, we see Elijah in a somewhat similar situation. He's being surrounded by a captain and 50 soldiers to bring him in to a, another king that he must have angered in some way, shape, or form. And what Elisha does is send down fire and kill that, uh, and kill that entire company of 50 men. Now, if Elisha was thinking the same way or used the same strategy in this exact situation, he could have triggered a full-scale war between these rivaling nations. So when God gives you a vision for the end result, which in this case, Elijah's vision for the end was peace with these people. It informs your judgment. It gives you the information you need to make decisions that will get you to the end result that you want. And if you read verse 21 and then 22, what he actually did, it enabled Elisha to act with compassion towards his enemy. In fact, in verse 22, after the king, shall I kill them, father? Shall I kill them? Elisha responds, do not kill them. Would you have killed men that you have captured with your own sword and bow? No. Set food and water before them so they can eat and drink and go back to their master. As the situation unfolds, the king did just that, prepared a great feast for them. And after eating and drinking, they went back to that same king of Aram who was ready to punish his own officials thinking that there was a mole and no more did they ever come back, or no more did they come back into that land to raid the Israelites. You see, when we have a vision of, what I like to think is sometimes you have to take a short-term loss to get a long-term win. How impressive would it have been for the king of Israel to say, I have killed, conquered all of these men. My citizens, you are safe with me. Look at what we're able to accomplish. But if you had killed these men, what would have happened? They just would have sent more. In fact, in the story where Elijah, his mentor, kills the, the, 50, the commander and the company of 50 men, he just sends another one. So he had to send fire down a second time. And then, the king just sends another one. You see, we all know the verse about, oh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. But sometimes we don't seem to grasp that fighting flesh, God says that because fighting flesh doesn't actually solve the problem. If fighting your flesh solved the problem, then when Cain killed Abel, he would have been happy. He would have gotten the end, would have gotten the end result he wanted. I killed Abel, now I'm God's favorite, now he enjoys my sacrifices and everything is fine and dandy. But that's not what happened. Think of it this way, not to be gruesome, but imagine there's some sort of serial killer, you know, popping around all the different states in the United States, 
and the police corner what they think is a suspect and detain that suspect, maybe even put him to jail, maybe even execute him. But if he was not the one committing the crime, the crimes will continue. You see, that's one of the main reasons God lets us know not only is there a spiritual battle underneath, but there's no point, there is no uh, fruitfulness, there is no benefit in attacking your brother and sister, even if it's coming through them. Because they are not the source, the enemy, after you crush this person or hurt this person, will just manifest the same problem somewhere else. But you have to have the vision to see that, to be able to know when to pull your punches. Pastor Mark gave this example back when we were younger, and I don't remember the context of the entire sermon, but he was trying to illustrate this point to us, how the enemy will use your brother to condemn you or, or, say, or to challenge you or to say something that really gets under your skin. And you may resist, 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 but when you finally break and you swing out to punch the enemy, the enemy ducks and you punch your brother. So <laughs> fighting in the flesh doesn't stop the problem. It only hurts another person. So here's, a, here's another kind of, a, kind of shocking thought. Remember how I said Elijah, when in a similar situation, he called down fire to, to burn up all the commanders, did it once, did it twice? Well, a little bit before then, Ahab was king. Ahab, this wicked man, would call Eli had the nerve to tell Elijah, oh, you trouble of Israel. That was one of his phrases. Whenever there was an issue, oh, Elijah, troubler of Israel. Us as Christians, reading the Bible with our perspective, it's funny to us because we know that it is Ahab troubling Israel. We know it is the wickedness of Ahab causing the blight and the plague and the, and the famine at that time. But he's blaming the man of God. Now, making my point here, how the things we do only hurts our brother. Imagine now you were the wife and children of one of those captains one of those commanders. And your mother might tell you, oh, I know Ahab says it's Elijah's fault, but that's not true. You know, the king we have is wicked, and Elijah's a good man of God, and you need to follow him. But then they wheel in the burnt, crispy body of your, of your husband. It might be really hard for that child to connect the pain that they've now influenced, they've now felt in this situation with the ultimate fault, the ultimate cause. Yes, it was the king's fault for doing it, but he's now connecting this pain with Elijah. So, why the Lord tells us not to fight against flesh and blood? Not only does it not solve the problem, not only does it hurt your brother, but you might inadvertently make the enemy's claim, the enemy's deception or lie about us or you more credible when you do that? What I say all the time, don't play into Satan's hands. Just like what Priscilla Shear said, if you can identify the source of something and you know that source is not of God, go in the opposite direction that is telling you. If the end result is hurting a, a fellow person, uh, even if they're not, even more so if it's another child of God, because God contends with you when you hurt his children. But we know that as Christians in a lost world, we are always striving to be winsome because we have souls on the line. Think of the ambassadors right now in war torn areas, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's the Middle East. They have ambassadors discussing amongst themselves, but you can be sure they are walking on eggshells. They are careful because they know the gravity of their words. They have a lot on the line. Who has even more on the line than us who understands, even if I win this fight, but I push this person a little bit farther from God, I just help the enemy rather than my father. We have even more. We can understand that that person has even more to risk, has even more to lose. And when you have that little compassion, then like Paul, we'll be able to say, I become all things to all men so that by any means I might win some. 
So God heals our vision, and when we ask him to heal our vision, it not only releases us from fear, it not only keeps us away from being misguided by influences, and also you don't know if you're being misguided, right? So this is something we have to pray for anyway. Because if you already knew it was a bad decision when you started following that college friend or that buddy to that place, you were not deceived. You chose to do that. That's a whole different prayer. <laughs> but again, we still pray for the Lord to clarify our vision because then it's also easier now to judge, to make a good judgment, and we're willing to take a short-term loss to be compassionate and negotiate a long-term win. And the very last reason we need to clarify the vision in any situation, whether this is a fight on the job, I'll give you a quick, quick example. I started a new job, this was about a year or so ago. I usually love new jobs and new places. I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert, but I'm still social. I love meeting people. I tend to make an okay first impression. This was the, probably one of the few times in my life that I met a group of people and they were not interested in me at all. Didn't want to talk, didn't want to teach me anything, didn't want to hear my opinions, didn't want to hear how I, even if I was trying to help them, they were not, not at all concerned. It got so bad that over the next two months, they would find ways to sabotage or to insult or to cut me down, even right in front of patients. Now, it's really easy when you're in that terrible situation to say, oh, I'm done. This must not be God's will. He sure did not mean for me to have to sit up and put up with something like this. But you know what me and my mom thought when we were talking about this situation? Oh, God must have something really good for you, honey, if it's this hard. <laughs> Do you know how it changes the way you come into work that next morning if you say, wow, there must be a really great blessing here. There must be somebody that needs salvation that I'm about to meet. There must be something for me if I'm getting so much opposition in the beginning. I can tell you guys now, I love that job. <laughs> and those people that didn't like me and didn't like the office so much, they're not even here anymore. They left. <laughs> Yeah, and here, here's how you know when, it's, uh, when they know they're wrong. Oh, I don't like the way this company is going. And all the thing, only thing the company was doing was giving you standards to follow. And you don't like the way the company is going. So you really, Jesus meant it when he said the meek will inherit the earth. <laughs> what it means by the meek will inherit the earth is after whoever it is that is holding control passes away. They don't have to die. They can just get promoted, get transferred, move away, decide they don't want to be here anymore. He has it in line for you. But if you slip out of position, like the enemy wants you to, obviously, right? Because he doesn't want to see anything good come from you. He doesn't want to see any fruit. Then you won't be there to receive it when it comes. So my very last point, the last and probably the greatest benefit of clarifying your vision of what I think God wants me to do here is that it helps you to persist. Florence Chadwick, in the early 20th century, was a well-known long-distance swimmer. She made it her mission to be the first woman to swim across the English Channel. The first time she tried to do so, she had trained for weeks, if not months, got into the water one mile, two mile. She went a total, and I think the total is like 26 or 27 miles of swimming. At some point in her journey, it starts to get dark. A thick fog descended over the water. And I don't know if it was a mix of exhaustion or fear or disorientation. She said she couldn't continue so that a rescue boat came and picked her up. Much to her shock and shame, when it pulled into the shoreline, she was one mile away from the other side. You see, right when the fog and the wind and the waves descend the hardest in your life, you might just be one mile away from this long distance swim that you have been working on your entire life. That's when the devil will try the hardest to derail you. But the story of Florence Chadwick did not end there. 
on her second attempt, she comes out, the same fog, the same wind, the same exhaustion. But she kept the image of the end in mind. That's like us knowing what God intends for you in your job, in any of your relationships, to help you keep the circumstances in perspective. She anticipated the fog, much like we have to anticipate enemy activity when we're doing something godly. But if the enemy is, but knowing that if the enemy is obscuring something in your path, there must be something good in there for you. Therefore, it's something worth fighting for. In fact, if the enemy doesn't want you to have it, it should absolutely be the thing that you want to do. And you need to decide in your mind to fight or do what is necessary to obtain that thing. Florence Chadwick persisted through her fear, her fears of failure, her fear of drowning, her fear of disappointing all of her trainers. She persisted through the wind and the waves trying to misguide her when she could not see. She persisted to the fog that tried to disorient her judgment. And Florence Chadwick was willing to suffer through short-term losses and pain for a long-term victory. Chadwick made it across the channel that second time she attempted it. She was the first woman to ever do so, and in doing so, set the world record for fastest time. And then you know what? After doing that, she turned right back around, swam the 26 miles back across the channel, and broke the world record for the second time. You see how it changes when you can clarify your vision. So I'd like to pray for you guys. Much like Elisha, oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, open our eyes so that we may see. Help us to see past our circumstance. Help us to see past the conflicts with loved ones and family and get to the root issue, Lord God. Strengthen our discernment and our judgment as to what to say and do to build up your kingdom rather than inadvertently play into the enemy's hand, Lord God. And help us to endure when you have shown us it is something worthwhile, that it is something good, Lord God. Teach us to hold our punches, to resist attacking or lashing out or being impatient so that we may not hurt our brother or prove one of the enemy's deceptions wrong. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, give us that joy in knowing that all the seeds we have planted and all the effort we are investing is accomplishing something, not just in your heavenly kingdom, Lord God, but even right here now on earth, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.